I want to begin with uh, just a brief passage here from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. The Apostle Paul, one of his prison epistles while he's in Rome, and he writes this to the church in Coloss, and he writes these words toward the end of his letter. This is really the final uh, advice that he gives in the letter of Colossians aside from some logistical information at the end of the book. But he says this in verse 2, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open for us a door for the Word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I've been imprisoned and that I might make it clear in the way I ought to speak and conduct yourselves with wisdom towards, outside, towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity, and let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. I have a, a little quiz this morning for the kids. And I would greatly appreciate their assistance. And if you're an adult with your kids here, if you could just help them out, that would be fine. But this, this is important information here to begin with, okay? Number one, whose wife was turned into a pillar of salt? What was his name? I'm going to go Candy. A lot what? A lot of what? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm just playing. You are right. It was Lot's wife became a pillar of salt. Very sad and devastating, interesting story from the book of Genesis. Now, number two, another story from the Bible. Need your help on, okay, kids? Listen up. Second Kings chapter 2, Elisha the prophet purifies some water by throwing something into it. Do you remember what it was that Elisha put in the water that made it pure? He, he said, bring me a pot with this in it. And then he takes it and he throws it in the water. And it just, everyone said, oh, the water here is bad. We can't drink of it. There's death in the water, Elisha. And he said, well, bring me this pot. I'll give you a hint. See, I see you're struggling. It starts with S and ends with alt. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. How did you know that? You did such a good job. That is right. Salt. There is salt in the water. Miracle as well, but there was something about the salt. All right, number three, true or false. Kids love true or false because you have a 50-50 shot, right? In the Bible, there is something called a covenant of salt. True or false? Did Pastor Dave just make that up out of thin air? Or is there really something in the Bible called a covenant of salt? True or false? Come on. Micah? True. You knew that. You did a good job. There is. If any of you who've read the Bible, it's actually mentioned several places in, in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, in Second Chronicles. A covenant of salt. And I could spend a a whole day on the covenant of salt, but it had to do with the enduring quality of salt and how these covenants were eternal. Every offering that the Hebrews offered had to have salt. Did you know that? Every offering had to have salt. Well, we're not going to talk about that all day. Okay, number four. The Bible talks about an area in Israel called the Salt Sea. The Salt Sea. But we call it something different today. What do we call the salt sea today? Timri. The Dead Sea. That is right. The little body of water. It's more of a lake. Both the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea have that term sea, but they're probably more accurately called a lake. And the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea because the salt content of the Dead Sea is so high that virtually nothing can live in it. It has ten times the salt content of the ocean, making about one-third of the weight of the water salt. Can you believe that? It's about 
salt. The density of the water is so high. Have any of you been there? Yeah, some of you have been there. I want to go. It sounds fascinating. The density is so high in the Dead Sea because of the salt saturation and the content, it's virtually impossible for a person to sink in the water. You, you, and swimming is, is said, you're, it's more like flapping around while floating. And you've, there's actually pictures. You can see people sitting. It's like they're sitting in a recliner reading a book in the uh, Dead Sea because the salt content uh, allows the density to be so much higher. Very fascinating uh, place. The, the lowest place on earth too, by the way. All right, last question, number five. All right, here we go. Who was it that said you are the salt of the earth, and when did they say it? Ah, Candy, you've been very helpful. There's others here in this congregation that I really want them to be involved with too. Any child would like to answer, that would be wonderful. Bill? Oh, hi, Bill. It's good to see you. Welcome back. Not that you're a child, but... All right, I'm going to open that up to an adult who may want to help out with this. Who said you're the salt of the earth? You know, you can't whisper it. You've got you to play the, by the rules. You've got to raise your hand and, and, and join the class here. Oh, my, you are so helpful today. Thank you. It was Jesus, and he was giving something that we call the Sermon on the Mount. You remember that, don't you? Well, I want to talk about salt this morning, if you haven't caught that yet. Salt. In Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, right after the Beatitudes, speaks these words to us in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. He says, you, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, right after that, Jesus says, you're the light of the world, and the light uh, you know, can't be hidden, a city on a hill, all that stuff. And we often focus more on the light. I don't know why, but uh, we often like to talk about the light and how we're all light and things like that. And we don't talk about the salt so much. We even sing a little song. Uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it. Why do we leave out the salt? I think the salt is jealous. I think we should sing the song, This salt shaker of mine, I'm going to shake it all the time. Hide it in a cupboard. No. I love salt. I like salt a lot. As a matter of fact, uh, if you were to... Uh, take me, or if I was to be at a party where there's lots of uh, very uh, healthy uh, food, uh, such as candy and cake and cookies. Don't listen. You over here. You're not listening. On one table, and then on the other table, there's crackers and chips and popcorn. Uh, you know, and I love sweets, too. Don't get me wrong. But I'll be at the table with the salty stuff. Anyone else with me on that one? A few people? Most people? Yeah, I got some, got some witnesses out here. That's right. So I, I tend to like salt a lot, and I've, I've learned so much about it in preparation for this sermon and studying about it, and I wanted to share with you a couple of, of fun facts that I learned about salt. One, salt is versatile, very versatile. Now, when you think about salt this morning, you think of your table salt, you might think of your um, salt to melt ice, right, out the step or out on the roads. What else do you think about with salt? Your, your, your uh, water softener system take salt, and you think, oh, okay, so salt's got three or four applications. You think of another one? Oh, yeah, salt with your food, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, there's some medicinal uses of salt. Um, but did you know that there are over 14,000 known uses for salt? That's a lot. Uh, most of those are chemical and industrial uses for processing certain things and in big factories and stuff. But uh, salt is much more impressive than just the, uh, the uh, fun flavoring that we use it for. It's incredibly versatile, used for just so many purposes. As a matter of fact, well, I'll talk about that in, in, in a minute, how important salt has been in history. Second of all, and this one shouldn't be a surprise to you, but salt is incredibly abundant 
And you think, well, ob- that's, that's so clear, obviously. The oceans are, are salt water. Uh, 3.5% of salt water is salt. So that means if you were to uh, get rid of all the water uh, in the oceans, that 3.5% of it would still be salt. That's trillions of metric tons of salt just in the oceans, let alone the salt mines and the great underground salt uh, uh, resources. The U.S. salt reserve alone could supply the world, based on current consumption, with salt for 100,000 years. It's a lot of salt. And as a matter of fact, one resource I looked at said that worldwide reserves of salt are estimated to be inestimable. (laughs) It's one of those few. As a matter of fact, salt is the most abundant mineral on the planet. And we can't estimate it, the experts say, because of the recycling process. The world is making salt faster than we're able to estimate its quantity. So you would think that because salt is so abundant, it must be very inexpensive and cheap. Wrong. Salt is very valuable. Just because it's abundant doesn't mean it's easy to get at. Salt has to be harvested, it has to be mined, it has to be processed for its various uses, and salt is therefore an industry of great value. Did you know that there is a salt lobby in Congress? And there is a salt special interest? Uh, The salt industry? In ancient times, salt at times would be so valuable it would be traded ounce for ounce for pure gold. As a matter of fact, I would challenge you, you probably don't realize how much salt is in your diet and in your daily life. If you were to try, which you probably are unable to do because of its uh, location all over our, our experience, but if you were to try to go without salt, even for a few days, no salt at all in any of its uses, you in a few days would begin to notice the value of salt. And you would probably be willing to pay more than you would see at the grocery store if it was in short supply. Roman soldiers during the height of Rome were paid partially in salt. Here's uh, your your gold and and here's uh, some land or something. Oh, and here's your salt. They called that portion of their pay their salarium from where we get our word salary. Isn't that interesting? Would you like to get paid in salt today? We could probably arrange that if you'd like. Over the course of history, nations have gone over to war, gone uh, gone to war over salt. Governments have been founded on salt production, salt taxes, and salt trade. And entire empires have collapsed due to a shortage of salt. Are you asleep yet? This is interesting to me. (laughs) So when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, we need to expand our vision beyond salt just being a fun food flavoring and contemplate perhaps wider implications. Yet Christ also understood the most simplistic application of salt was culinary. As I mentioned, I've always liked salt. I tend to enjoy salt. I've never met a pickle I didn't like. My grandmother always had a great supply of candy when the grad and kids would come over, and my sister and my cousins would go to the candy dishes. I would go to the refrigerator and say, where are your pickles? And she always had a pickle for me. Salt. Oh, yeah. Just a little anecdote this morning. I hope you'll uh, allow me. I just want to show you how seriously I take Jesus' words that you are the salt of the earth, okay? Take it very soberly and seriously. So I just want to illustrate this for a minute for you this morning with a little object lesson here. Did you know that it is a fact of human psychology that if a speaker has a mystery bag with them, people pay attention more? It's a fact. Human curiosity drives us to pay attention and wonderment of what will come out of the bag. That's why magicians have bags full of tricks. It is simply, if their tricks are bad, it doesn't matter. As long as they keep pulling stuff out of that bag, people pay attention. I had a teacher in high school, uh, in junior high rather, who uh, whenever the class got out of hand, he had a bag. And all he would do is he would go over to that bag and take it over and put his hand in it. And within 10 seconds, everyone was watching him. 
and he would pull out all kinds of stuff. That was his way of getting our attention, and it worked. Okay, how many of you know what this is? Oh, it's Hoff Ramen. Of course you know what this is. You love this. This is a staple of the American diet. Mm. This happens to be uh, my favorite uh, flavoring, too. It's the chicken flavoring. Um, it also happens to be the one with the highest salt content. You know how much salt is in this? I don't know how they get it in that little flavor package. I'm looking at the back here, and salt, of course, in food is called sodium. It has 910 milligrams per serving. 910. Do you know what the recommended daily amount is? In the US, they keep moving it in the United States. Canada is ridiculous. But in the United States, it varies between 1,700, and their upper limit is 2,300 milligrams a day. 2,300 milligrams. This is 910 per serving. And guess what? There are two servings in this. Now, how many of you have ever eaten half of a bag of Top Ramen? That's ridiculous. Two servings, 1,820 milligrams. That would be, for many people, and if you're a slight build, that would mean your entire day's salt content right here. Now, that's not all, though. When I make my favorite kind of Top Ramen, my wife is rolling her eyes at me right now. But whenever I make uh, mine, I don't just leave it the way it is, I doctor it up. Mm. Now, I, I have people, do you pour the juice out when you make your top ramen or do you eat it with the juice? Man, some people pour that salty, buttery goodness out. It just drives me crazy. All right. Now, after God made the earth and he made the animals and the plants and he made man, um, what the Bible doesn't tell you is that on the eighth day, he made Yoshida's. And it was good, yes, very good. And so if you like, you take about a tablespoon of this and you put it in the top ramen. And it just flavors it up wonderful. Gives it a little smoky, sweet flavor. And uh, I apologize, this is not a healthy recommendation this morning. Uh, now, how much salt is in this? Let's see, so 460 milligrams more. Anyone doing the math? 1820 plus 460. I don't know, what is that, about 2,300 milligrams. Now, what do you do, though, after you've eaten the noodles and it's got the buttery goodness of Yoshida's in it and you're left with the little thing of the juice? What? You can't throw that away. No, 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 no. So then, by the way, anyone staying for potluck? you got to sop up that juice. And I, I'm the type, some people don't like soggy bread. Jim, do you like soggy bread? I like soggy bread myself. I take a couple slices of bread, and I just sop up that. Mmm. Now, bread has a lot of salt in it. Did you know that? This uh, is not the worst of it. Some bread has a lot more. 135 milligrams per slice. That's another uh, 270 milligrams for two slices. And if I've added it up right, it's over 2,500 milligrams for one small, slight snack of a meal. I told you I'd take it literally when Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. I'm just following Jesus' advice. I'm making myself salty. <laughs> Is that what Jesus meant? What? You know, Although contrasting what Michael Bloomberg tells us in New York, Jesus does say that salt is good. Do you know that? Right now there's a, a big movement. I know there may be a physician here today and you have to give all kinds of advice. There's a lot of uh, interesting things out there about salt. But Jesus in Mark 9 said salt is good. Do you know that? Salt is good. But if it becomes unsalty with what, will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves. That's what Jesus says. And be at peace with one another. Now I'm just having fun though, right? He's talking about something spiritual here, isn't he? But it's out of the commonness of salt and everyone's understanding of salt that Jesus draws our attention to it because there's something very important. <coughs> Excuse me. Some lesson he wants us to understand about salt. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, if you've been in Sabbath school studies or Bible studies or maybe in sermons, you've heard 
a, a, a lesson on salt before. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you've studied it and you've heard the uh, 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 connections with salt being a preservative, with salt being a healing agent, rubbing salt in the wound, that type of thing. By the way, if you ever go to the hospital, one of the first things they do is they hook you up to an IV and put saline in you. They sometimes don't even know what's wrong with you yet, and they're hooking you up to saline because they know that most people are dehydrated, and that saline immediately hydrates the body, and it improves your overall health almost immediately. It helps medicine to get to your, the places it needs to get to faster. It, it just makes the blood vessels work better and all those uh, things that I don't understand, but they just know that salt will help. It's salt water. That's what saline is, salt water, right into your veins. You've heard the explanations of how salt is used for preserving foods, for, for uh, uh, beauty purposes, flavoring. These are all the common uses. They're instructive and that we should live today as the salt of the earth. But for 2013, for the first sermon you may be hearing for the year, I want to cut right to the bottom of this line of teaching and suggest that Christ calls us salt because Christ, Salt, when used appropriately and properly, makes just about everything better. Just about everything salt comes into contact with, it improves. It makes bland things tasty. It makes sweet things sweeter. It keeps food from spoiling. It softens and tenderizes. They help, I've already mentioned the things it does for your body when it's used for Medicinal purposes, it fights infection. When Jesus calls us salt, he is saying, now you are an abundant source of unlimited goodness in the earth. That is your job. Everything and everyone you touch should be improved because of their interaction with you. I just want to stop there and let that sink in for a minute. Because, by the way, when, when I was praying about this and when the Lord was, was really touching me about this, I had to stop when he put that in my mind. Really? Everything and everyone we touch should be better because of us. Is that a humbling thought to you? Boy, it is to me. Can you sit there this morning and honestly say that you have felt that everyone you've touched in the last week is better off because of it? Well, before you jump to conclusions, let's just think about it for a minute. Our job, our calling, our duty as servants of God is to be a blessing. Amen? I'm not sure anyone here agrees with me yet. I'm going to have to work on you a little bit. <coughs> a benefit, an improvement in the lives around us. And it is non-negotiable. It's not optional. It's not when you have time, when you're thinking about it, maybe at church, when you're on your mission trip, then you need to think about being a blessing. Jesus says that salt that does not perform its function is less than worthless. <coughs> he says it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled in, in Mark's version he says it's not even good for the manure pile i mean can he make it any clearer than that salt that does not perform its function that loses its saltiness or does not have the saltiness it should is of no value now i want to share with you an experience i had that illustrated this for me i was taking my uh, car to get a, an oil change. And I won't say where. Um, I was just hoping to get in there in a jiffy and be done with it. Um, and I hate, I really don't like, in the first place, going to these places. But let me, I had every excuse in the world to be grumpy. I did. I was sick. I was just starting to get an ear infection. It was early in the morning. And uh, what other excuses can I think of? I was grumpy. And last but not least, I'm, I, 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 all I want is an oil change. But of course, and I know it's just their job, but they're there to sell you everything they got in the shop. 
And they've got additives that, boy, if you put it in your tank, it'll increase your mileage. You'll drive around the world and never fill up again. If you just put this additive in, you only need it once, but they'll sell it to you special two-for-one deal, right? And you try to be polite, and you go through the spiel. You say, thank you. No, I just want the oil change, please. Just the oil change. Okay, but then they do their service uh, inspection for you. And oh, my goodness, you've got to have this, this, and that. And boy, if you keep doing this, your death and destruction is going to follow. you got to, for $100, they'll fix that, take care of you. <coughs> and you just say, no, no, please. Just, just change the oil for me, please. Okay? So you get a little cynical. When you're at that, right? Any of you know what I'm talking about here? You just, you just want the service and you want to go home and be done with it. So uh, in order to soothe my grumpiness, I had my, my Bible with me. And in my Bible, I often carry a devotional of some kind. And this happened just last week, by the way. So I thought, I, I, I'm going to read from Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, right? That's what you should do when you're grumpy. <laughs> So I pull out thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, and I'm, 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 I'm preparing for the sermon, and I'm reading about salt, and I'm, I'm reading about the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm reading it, and uh, just uh, really being blessed by it while I'm grumpy. And uh, the guy, he's ready to check me out, and he says, okay, we got you, well, we're, we're, we're going to run your card and uh, get you out of here. And he sees me reading from a devotional, and he says, oh, is that my utmost for his highest? Which is, uh, oh, Russ, what a blessing you are. Is there any salt in that? I hope not. Well, um, which is Oswald Chambers' uh, devotional. Actually, his wife put it together um, after he died. A powerful book, by the way, Utmost for His Highs. And I was in such a, a down, grumpy mood. I wasn't even really listening. I just said, well, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it is. And then I thought, well, wait, no, it wasn't. It's not my Utmost for His Highs. It's, it's Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. So I pulled it out of my, my Bible and said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. It's, it's this book. It's, it's thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And he looked at it and he says, wow, I've not read that. I bet that, that looks really good. I've not read that. I've not even seen that. And I said, yeah, well, anyways, can I just get out of here, please? And shoved it in my, I wasn't quite that crass. But. And he said, oh, yeah, he checked me out. Walks me out of the car, you know, so, so great. And he says, hey, well, God bless you. And I, yeah, you too, buddy. <laughs> Got my car. Okay, guys, I'm sorry. I know I'm a bad, bad person. As I'm driving away, I thought to myself, or maybe the Lord brought to my mind, did I really make the most of that opportunity? Did I make the most of it? Now you can say, well, I didn't hurt him, right? Uh, you, I was a silent witness. He saw a, a, a wonderful devotional book by Ellen White. Maybe he'll go to the store and find it, go online and, and, and become an Adventist and preacher, evangelist, and, and many will come to the Lord because of him, right? I didn't hurt him. I was neutral. I was lukewarm. I was tasteless. You know, an opportunity is like that. Now, I could still, you know, maybe I should. Maybe some of you are thinking it's not too late. I could still go by there and say, hey, remember you mentioning this book? I'd like to give it to you. And, and that might still be a blessing. But in the moment is when you have the greatest opportunity. Not as an afterthought. Not as an afterthought. I missed an opportunity to be a significant blessing that maybe the Lord was orchestrating on my behalf. I wasn't salt. I was crusty. But I wasn't salt. Paul said, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. What are you giving me now? Is that a cough drop? Wow, so thoughtful, guys. This is wonderful. Verse 6, he says, let your speech Always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. When you lay your head down on your pillow at night, and in your mind reflect upon the things you've done during the day, think about all the opportunities you had to be a blessing, to be a source of goodness to those around you. To be something that everybody wants. Are you satisfied? 
with each and every interaction? Every single person who came into contact with Christ was better because of it. They say, well, wait a minute. What about, you know, there were mobs and there was Pharisees and Pilate and Herod. Everyone had an opportunity to be better just because they didn't accept it. Well, what about the money changers? Come on. What about the, he overturned their tables. What about the Pharisees? He said, woe to you Pharisees, you whitewashed tombs. Oh, you're terrible. Well, the Bible says that a loving father disciplines his children. Speaking of children, when you discipline your children, is it to make them better or is it to make you feel better? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Enough from the peanut gallery, Howard. <laughs> Are you a blessing in your home, in your job? in your daily chores and errands, in your driving. When I was first getting my license, my youth pastor at the time said, Dave, never, never put a Christian bumper sticker on the back of your car. I said, why? Why not? I want to put the fish or, you know. He said, you will do something you regret while driving a car. And as you peel away, they will look and they will see that you're a Christian. He was serious. He said, and they will blame all Christians because of your actions. I have God's closet on the back of my car. I hope that's okay. <laughs> you know, when we drive, we think we can do mean things because we think we're anonymous. I'm going to honk and I'm going to do all these things and I'm going to be rude because at some point they'll go left, I'll go right. We live in a city of 300,000. We'll never see them again. They'll never know who I am. And even if we do, we'll have forgotten it. <coughs> I can be as rude and crude as I want to be because it's anonymous. Is that true? <coughs> Boy, we struggle with our driving habits of being a blessing. I know I do. In the church, are you salt? Are you here to be a blessing? I want to challenge you all this morning, all of us together, to, in 2013, to take Jesus' words seriously about being the salt of the earth and make it our goal that every chance we have to interact with people, in some way, in some form, they are better because of it, not worse not neutral. They are improved. Everyone knows the benefits of salt. Wouldn't it be great if the people we interact with on a daily basis could see Jesus in us and understand the blessings of being a child of God? You can be that person. You must be that person. And by God's grace, we will all be that person.